these meteorites, the very small ones, will uh, trace a uh, line of light in the sky. They will come down and we will actually have a physical object which will come down to Earth. And this is a very typical one. It weighs about 500 grams. It's about this big. Uh, this is the biggest meteorite that's been found. So it's about uh, 5 meters in diameter. Uh, I should mention that in ancient Greece there were a number of meteorites which were actually worshipped uh, as um, heaven-sent objects, sent objects sent down by Zeus. Uh, there's evidence for some at uh, Delphi, for instance, that were actually a uh, worship. If the meteorites are slightly bigger, then they explode in the air. And uh, this was one that uh, I think many people have seen, everybody's seen hundreds of webcam footage of this explosion. This was the sort of event you get about every hundred years. Uh, meteorites, you probably get hundreds or thousands would fall every year. If you get still bigger objects, then uh, they don't explode in the atmosphere. They come down to the surface of the Earth at their full speed. And that can be anywhere from 15 to 60 kilometers a second. And they hit the Earth and they generate a crater. And so the smallest crater that we found so far is about 30 meters, so it's a little bit bigger than this room. And the biggest one is 250 kilometers. And this is an example from uh, near where I live. It's the Canadian Shield. And this is the Manicuagan crater, which was about 100 kilometers in diameter. The lake there is actually only about 60 kilometers, but the structure extends further out. So they produce very large uh, impact structures. Um, the one I'm going to talk about is a bit smaller. You get impact structures all over the world. Um, they're mostly known from uh, areas where there's a lot of Precambrian rocks, uh, simply because the preservation of these structures uh, is sufficiently long that we can uh, see them. You can see in Europe there are relatively few known except in Northern Europe. I don't think there are any known from Greece. 
Um, a lot known from Australia, and in Canada and the US, we have a lot. But one's always looking for more. Um, this is a very simplified graph of how often an event happens here versus the size of the crater or the size of the object. And so, for instance, the Manicuagan crater one I just showed you, that one happens probably uh, about every uh, 50 or 100 million years and it generates a crater 100 meters in diameter. The Chelyabinsk, uh, that was the explosion in Siberia, that sort of event probably happens, uh, it's indicated every year, but it's, it's actually moved a little bit, it should be about every century there. Uh, and the kind of structure I'm going to talk about, Corosol, is here. So it's intermediate, it's a, a few kilometers in diameter, and it probably happens every uh, few million years that you get uh, this kind of uh, event. So a little bit about impact craters, because as you say, you're probably not particularly familiar with them. When the object comes in, it moves so fast that uh, it generates an explosion. And it's simply because the front of the meteorite is stopped by the Earth, and the back continues. And so it increases the pressure until it explodes. And the first cycle of the events generate this. It generates a small conical, or it generates a conical crater. The red stuff here is molten rock. It melts the rock in the space of a few seconds to maybe 10 seconds. And the rock blasts out in this jet of molten rock. What happens next depends on how big the structure, was, the uh, impactor was. If the impactor is quite small, then it produces a simple crater. Uh, the blue stuff here is uh, uh, breccia. The red stuff, again, is molten rock. And you end up with a simple structure like that, like a pole. If the object is bigger, then it produces a more complex structure. The with a central part which is uplifted and a series of rings around the outside. And this is simply because the center of the crater is compressed and it bounces back. And also you get uh, landslides from the sides. Because for a meant like Manicuaga, the crater would probably have been 10 or 15 kilometers deep with vertical sides. So the crater only existed in that form for maybe two or three minutes before it completely collapsed. So I'm going to talk about one structure that we found by accident and a little bit about the social aspects of uh, the science as well, not only just the science itself. So I live here in this town called Shibudumi, and this is up here. This is an area where I did my PhD and I've been going back forever. Um, this is the discovery map. It, Setil is a major port uh, for exporting iron ore. And the Canadian Hydrographic Commission had, uh, is in charge of maintenance of ports. So they did a side scan, multi beam sonar uh, study for getting the depth of the uh, harbour here just for maintaining the harbour facilities. But you can see that the harbour is up here. And you ask, well, why did they have that huge area down here? And the reason was that the Ministry of Defence, the Canadian Ministry of Defence, uh, wanted to make sure that there were no abandoned uh, bombs from the Second World War in this area. Because this is a problem in many parts of the world. At the end of the Second World War, the military just dumped all their old equipment everywhere and didn't record where they put it. So they did a survey out here to make sure there were no bombs. And they found this structure, this circular structure here. And that is uh, about four kilometers across. Um, these structures here are limestone ridges. So this whole area up here, which I say I've worked on for over 40 years, is actually a landmine for contrusion. And just here is a tiny bit of limestone. And this is a, a younger limestone which has been deposited on it. So we found this structure, and it was quite mysterious. The 
the government didn't know what to do with it because the Hydrographic Commission had no um, uh, role for research. But they didn't want to let anybody else look at it because they were very proud of the fact that they found this thing. So nothing happened for about five years uh, because nobody would release a proper copy of the map and nobody would do any research. But eventually this changed a little bit and they started to release the data. And this is what it looks like in detail. So this is four kilometers across. It's got a central uplift. It's got a moat around here. Uh, these are seismic lines. Uh, and the outer structure is these concentric rings like this. And it has these things here, which we call rabbit ears, which we have no idea what they are, uh, how they form, or anything. Um, the water is quite deep here, uh, and then very shallow in here. So the big question was, what was this thing? Uh, this is a digital train model of that. You can see the rabbit ears there, the moat, uh, and these concentric rings. And that's another view of the crater. This is the edge of the crater. Uh, and uh, these things marked questers are thought to be limestone fragments. So the final image I've got from the original study is this. This is a backscattered uh, image. And we've got the crater there. You can see these long structures of this orientation. This is glaciation. So uh, these are, uh, the glaciers flowed in this direction and shaped it. So we know that there must have been a small amount of glaciation uh, in this area, overrun it after we had the event. So the problem is, what is it? Uh, and um, most people who work in craters, me included, would say it looks like an impact crater. But it was very difficult to convince people, everybody, that it was. Some people said, well, it's a volcano, but this is eastern Canada. Don't answer me volcanoes, though. Uh, or it could be a Kimberlite, but there aren't any Kimberlites that are young. Uh, and other people suggested that it was actually related to a salt, it was a salt dome. But salt domes never have a, a, a central uplift. And the sediments are only 20 meters thick, uh, so you can't do it. So, the question was, how did we prove that this was an impact crater? And remember, this is in very shallow water. This, the, the upper part of this thing uh, is um, here. It's only at, up there. It's only, at four, in, only in 40 meters depth. So um, 160 meters down here. So we're all very close to the surface. Uh, so we decided to do a bit more work on it. This is the small research vessel. Uh, we used uh, um, for the geophysics work uh, belongs to University of Quebec in, in Ramuzi. Um and so a kind of typical thing but it's a very small vessel we didn't have uh, a remote operating vehicle or anything like that we just had um, seismics, magnetics and a dredging equipment on it so the first thing we tried to do was to try and see whether we saw a magnetic signature for the crater, because some craters have a magnetic signature. If you imagine if you've got an impact, you're melting rocks, you're brecciating them, it's going to imprint a magnetic structure on it, or it should do. But this is the area, and you can see, you can see a nice concentric structure, but that's 80 kilometers in diameter. That's the intrusion. That's not actually the structure itself. If you blow up this little area in here, that's the crater, the inner part of the crater, the outer part of the crater, and the curved magnetic structures you see here are just like this here. It's the edge of a circular intrusion in fact. And so curiously enough, we don't have a magnetic signature for this structure, which would rather surprise us. So we then looked at uh, seismics, uh, a bit of chirp seismics. Um, so this is a section that runs from here to here. Um, and this part here is, this is part of the wall. It doesn't run through the central uplift. It runs through the moat and then runs down here like this. So this structure here, these are multiples of the seismics. 
so we're not seeing anything interesting in there. And you can see the sediment layers very nicely uh, imaged. On the top of this section here, which is this bit in here, you can see there's very little sediment. In fact, it's almost completely bare. And then in the moat here, I've got a blow up of this here. We've got the sediments coming down. We've got the structure here. And then we're looking down into the bedrock under the sediments here. So there is, in fact, very little in the way of sediment in this crater, which implies that it's very young because we are, this area was glaciated. Um, the glaciers withdrew about 12,900 years ago, and we dated that from dating shells within this section here. So we know from looking at the crater that the glaciers had overrun it. There was probably a maximum of three kilometers of ice at this point, and then it's withdrawn. So the argument is it probably must be young because otherwise the glaciers would have filled this up with sediment quite readily, and yet we don't see that. And this age here we have here is just simply the age of deglaciation. Uh, it's nothing, but it can't be younger than that. That's the, the story. So we had a bit more seismic, we had some sparker seismics which had a little better penetration, and we could trace out this surface here, and below it, it's very strongly faulted, which again is what you'd expect for a crater, because you know, you're generating a big hole in the ground. It's going to be faulted before all the stuff material comes in. And then we have deposition of more sediments on top, and that's presumably essentially late glaciation sediments deposited by the retreat of the glaciers. So we wanted to take some samples, and I, and I say unfortunately we didn't have a remote operated vehicle, we had a dredge. And the dredge, for those of you who've ever worked with it, is an extremely inelegant machine. It's a, just a big bucket. You lower it down, you lower it down like that, you haul up a sample, and it's mud, it's smelly, there's shells in it, there's all kinds of living things in it that are not happy at all. And uh, anyway, so you, we got the mud and we tried to take the samples from areas where there was very little sediment. But of course we couldn't take it from places with no sediment because otherwise the dredge wouldn't pick up any samples. So we washed the mud off and classified the blocks. If the blocks were rounded, we put them aside because they were pebbles, they were clearly deposited by rivers and probably rafted out on ice. But we started collecting some of the angular fragments, which all turned out to be limestone, despite the fact that limestone is only 28 meters thick. And they're almost all breccias. And this one was the one that was most interesting once we looked at it. And the reason was that this is a thin section view, so that's about 30 centimeters long. It's a, it's a breccia, like the other ones. And this is a view of it in reflected light. And you can see there are some bits which are white there, i.e. they've got a very high reflectance. Now normally when you're, when you're looking at thin sections, you have something that's got a high reflectance. You think of sulfide minerals or perhaps magnetite. Uh, but these things turn out to be nothing of the sort, but glass. And the reason that they're reflected is because it's the same reason that a mirror is reflected, it's because they're actually made of glass. So, when I started looking at the section, the first thing I saw was these things here, which look very strange. These are all fragments of carbonate, and then this thing here, which I couldn't work out what it was. And when you put in cross-polarized light, you realize that it's actually isotropic. So these are actually fragments of glass. And again, you don't expect to see fragments of glass in a, uh, in a, a limestone breccia sediment, except in the context of an impact. Because an impact melts everything so fast that you get compositions which make no geological sense. Because the melting is happening in seconds. And it's so intense that anything can get melted. 
you can have, I'll show some late, later evidence that I think the carbonates will melt it. Uh, again, because you're so far from equilibrium with these structures. So this is what they look like when you see them a bit more. They look like a perfect droplet, like that, with these swirly lines in them. And these again, they're fragments of glass. And with a, scan, with a, with a scanning electron microscope, you see more of these beautiful fragments of glass. And now you see there are two components. It's the pile stuff and the dark grey stuff. Anyway, so we started to analyze them. And it turns out this stuff that has a high atomic number, a uh, backscattered electron image, is the opaque material. And some of this uh, glassy material is like this. It's actually vesicular. And again, you know, vesicular glass is a very strange thing to see in, uh, in a, a sed essentially sedimentary rock. So what we did is we did some chemical analysis and the glass composition has uh, each of the um, droplets has a very strange composition. This is a graph of phosphorus versus calcium. You see they're running at 36 to 40 percent phosphorus and they're running at about 50 to 55 percent calcium. So when I saw these glasses drop, I thought they've got it quartz. And then we got the analysis and we said, no, this isn't quartz at all. This is actually appetite. This is a glass made by melting appetite and each individual glass droplet has its own composition. So some of these are running at 5% fluorine, although the precision is very poor on, on fluorine. So the composition is close to floor appetite. Again, this is the weird material. As far as I know, this is, this is the only example of floor appetite glass in the world. Nobody's ever described it before. So, there are certainly calibration errors. We then looked at the opaque component, and it turns out to be close to pyrite. Uh, it's not a glass, it's actually crystals. Um, but it's a kind of weird combination to have a glass that melts at 1600 degrees Celsius. Again, totally what you would not expect. It appeared to have solidified in the air and then broke up on impact. Uh, and we've got to have a protolith, which is close to fluorapatite and pyrite. And it turns out that many limestones actually have a component with this composition. And this is essentially the remains of, of fossil bones uh, and fossil, uh, essentially, coprolites in limestones. <coughs> so it's perfectly correct, we certainly could have those components. But it's kind of weird as to why you would have droplets <coughs> of this composition when I'm not seeing droplets uh, of carbon. But we do have limestone, so it's a reasonable thing. So the, we were looking for something else, which is uh, in the kind of gold standard for identifying impact structures is a structure in quartz called planar deformation features. This is a quartz crystal, and you can see it here in plain polarized light, cross polarized light. The first thing you notice in cross polarized light is that some bits are pale and some bits are dark, i.e., the birefringents. Ah, okay. Uh, the birefringents here is very low, and the birefringents here is much higher. Now, quartz normally never shows any variation in birefringents. But what's happened here is this bit is probably um, actually isotropic because it's being transformed into a glass. But the structure we were looking for is called planar deformation features. So if you take these pile bits and you blow them up, you see these kind of 45 degree lines. I've got two photos of them there with this kind of orientation, which kind of looks like twinning in many minerals, but it's not actually twinning at all. It's actually um, a deformation feature, and these structures are aligned with glass, in fact. 
because of the shock. This is considered very good evidence for meteorite impact. So once you've got this kind of thing, you can say more or less that you're sure. The problem is we only found one grain of this. And normally people expect to have hundreds of grains. We just got one. So um, the problem also was that these are very poor quality uh, images. We were expecting something that looked really much nicer than that. Uh, and the problem is that although the angle is correct for them and they're associated with dry, glassy droplets um, they're not quite what, what you would expect because they've been thermally metamorphosed and this again makes sense imagine you've got a crater you're producing 1600 degrees celsius to melt the appetite the stuff goes up in the air and it comes right down um, probably a minute or two later, maybe a second or two later. And so you will instantly, this material will all be extremely hot and will actually metamorphose itself. So this probably explains why they don't look so good. We also found a rather mysterious uh, structure here. These are fragments of calcite and they're glued with this cement which is full of these crystals. And it turns out that these crystals are dolomite and the material around them is calcite and pyrite. So again, it's difficult to say, but I think this is actually molten carbonate, which is uh, molten limestone, which has been fused by the impact, uh, and then has actually cemented the whole structure here. But it's a little unclear, and uh, there's a lot of discussion about whether you can actually melt limestone. Uh, with during impacts. So the conclusions we had is that it, that it is an impact crater and it's probably young but it's got to be older than 12,900 but we haven't been able to actually get an age yet for it. Uh, it's maybe possible uh, to date it. Uh, it must be post order vision uh, so younger than 450 million years old. Um, my colleagues think that it is um, actually uh, a little older, a paleogene or neogene, a particularly paleogene. I think it's younger than the last glacial because it has no sediments in it. <laughs> and we are trying to date it with uranium helium, but it hasn't been a great success so far. So anyway, so we were we had this and we wanted to publish it. And Anybody who's done research knows that <coughs> you have sometimes problems getting papers published. And so we put this together in a paper and the reviewers were extremely critical of it. They said, it can't be an impact structure. And we said, well, it can't be anything else. But, you know, that, that didn't count. And they said, well, <coughs> you could have molten appetite by terrestrial processes. I said, well, if I had a volcano which was producing appetite glass at 600 degrees, 1600 degrees Celsius, I would be, that would be the subject of the paper. It wouldn't be an impact structure. It would be totally unique to have a volcano spewing out this kind of material. And so the problem, they were extremely critical of it. And the source of the problem was this age. Okay. That's one source. The other source was that this is an article from Wired magazine about how everybody can go hunting for craters in the world. You just need to look at Google Earth. You find any vaguely circular structure and you say it's an impact crater. And so everybody does this. And the result is that you're just deluged with people who say they've found impact craters. I had somebody write to me an email and said, I found an impact crater in southern Quebec. And you look at Google Earth, it's indeed a, a round structure. The only problem is, it's a conical hill, like this. They haven't even checked that it was the right way. And so you get maps like this, where all of these yellow dots are probably not craters at all. And this guy, for instance, who's, who's a bright guy, a physicist, 
every single curved structure he in the Earth he proposed was an impact crater. So you see there, you know, even even things like the Black Sea is, is two impact craters together. And he got even better than this. He had this one as a, an impact crater for the Amazon basin. And he points out that South America is almost perfectly round. He said, well, South America isn't perfectly round. <laughs> Unless you draw a circle on it, it's clearly not round at all. So anyway, so that's, that was his idea. And so there's certainly a lot of very strange people out, and this somewhat biases those that are working on hill craters. The other problem was the age, 12,900. Um, and I have to put, give you a little background as to why that age is a problem. Um, the colonization, the early colonization of North America uh, was by a group of people, hunters, called the Clovis people. And they are defined on terms of this shape of arrow. And they came down from uh, Siberia through a number of corridors, possibly along the coast, and people from North America. So these are the ancestors of the current uh, First Nations, or, or possibly of some of the First Nations, because there have been other events. This culture appeared to have ended about 12,900 years ago. Um, it's not always very clear quite why, and the date is not very exact, but it appears to have ended at that point. And the usual explanation as to why this happened was this period. So this is the glacial maximum, the coldest period of time, about 20,000 years ago. And the temperature warmed up as the glacial period finished. And then 12,900 years ago, the temperature went right down. And we had this tremendous cooling. It was about 900,000 years of cold weather. And then the temperature shot right up and kept warming again to the kind of climate we have now. So this period is called the Younger Dryas. And this period of cooling here, of course, coincides with the end of the Clovis people. So it's possible that their culture finished because the climate cooled and they were unable to adjust fast enough to the cooling climate. The problem is, why did this happen? And the usual explanation is uh, a glacial lake that discharged very rapidly into the North Atlantic and changed the uh, circulation of the oceans. But, of course, there are other people who have other ideas. And this guy is probably one, the one who's been produced some of the stranger ideas. This guy is called Richard Firestone. He's a physicist. No, he's no stupid guy. He's a bright guy. He worked for the US uh, government, uh, Lawrence uh, Livermore Laboratory. Anyway, he proposed, first of all, that the Clovis people were killed off by a giant nuclear catastrophe um, that there was probably a supernova in the region and the gamma ray flux killed off all of the native people in North America at this point. Um, he then elaborated and he proposed that the, the gamma ray flux was so high that it reset all the carbon-14 ages of this time. So, anyway, people soon pointed out that if you had a gamma ray flux that high, you would sterilize the entire Earth. There would be nothing left, <laughs> except possibly bacteria. So, um, anyway, he felt that he was onto something. So he reworked this idea as a meteorite impact. And he wrote this from a book with a rather lurid cover, which said that everything in the past was due to meteorite impacts and that this controlled all the development of culture and the cultures it began and finished with giant impacts or floods and various other things so which is kind of strange but anyway what happened was this is um, uh, a lot of people started to try and do research to either prove or disprove this idea but remember that the age that he's proposing for this is 12,900 and um, 
they published the papers in this journal, which has a rather strange name. This is the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Now, the curious thing about this is it's archaic. And normally, when you want a paper published, you have reviewers, they give a critical comment, and it's accepted or rejected. But this one, the Academy of Science, you can get it published without going through reviewers. Um, it's rather curious. The French have the same, the same system for the uh, Academy des Sciences de Paris. You can get it through if you know somebody in the Academy, but then you don't have to go through a review. So these papers, we don't know whether they were reviewed or not. <laughs> anyway, they found what they claimed was all kinds of evidence at 12,900, I won't go through all the different things, for an impact, for impacts in the world. And this has been fought out for about 15 years now. People who say, this is not evidence for an impact, or this is evidence for an impact. And uh, this one, for instance, is somebody's claim to have found nano diamonds in, in, uh, in ice in Greenland. And this has been fought out now for some time. And it's been quite a driver of research. But we, unfortunately, had a problem because we were proposing an impact at an age older than 12,900. But Richard Firestone and his friends seized on that 12,900 and said, we were proposing the impact at that age. Whereas in fact, we just said, it's got to be older than that age. There's no particular significance, it's just deglaciation. So this is why we had a lot of problems publishing this, was because we got associated with essentially somewhat kooky science, um, which may have some, it may be real, but the, most, of the, most of it has been somewhat badly done. Uh, these nanodiamonds, for instance, are not thought now to be nanodiamonds at all. But they may be something special. So it is extremely dis disputed. So we fought it out. Uh, and finally, not only did we get it published in the journal we wanted, Meteoritics, we actually made the front cover in the end after we finally fought it out. But there are many people who don't accept that this is a crater at all, uh, simply because they say it can't be a crater because the age is associated with Richard Firestone and his friends, even though we've said that that's not the age that we said it was. So we're still being downed from this uh, peripherally. So why, I, I think that I should finish up the last slide about what the role of oceanography is in this, because this kind of structure was found by accident in shallow water, but there is undoubtedly a lot of small impact structures that are present in shallow water and will be found by oceanographic systems. So the ones in deep water, no, because we don't have a resolution. But shallow water, yes, and there's an awful lot of them. And the reason why it's important is that this graph here is the more scientific version of the graph I showed at the beginning, which is basically the mass of the impactor versus the uh, impacting rate. And so up here are our are, 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 uh, impactors of 100 milligrams, and up down here is an impactor of 10 to the 15 grams. So we've got a range of 10 to the 16th in uh, mass of impactor. And the impacting frequency is also has a tremendous rate. And you can see we get more or less a straight line, which suggests that stuff's coming in of all sizes all the time. But if we look at craters, I put in the red line here, you can see that it shallows off. So we don't know, we haven't found small craters. And there should be thousands of small craters. And we found probably half a dozen where small craters mean like 50 meters in diameter. And even ones of a few kilometers in diameter are not nearly as abundant. So they should be found sooner or later. It's a question of simply looking out for them uh, and trying to recognize when you see something that looks round and a hole, it could be an impact crater. Proving it afterwards, of course, is another problem. But, uh, but I think there's a tremendous role for uh, oceanography in uh, particularly uh, pathometry studies.
to actually find these kind of structures. So, thank you very much for your attention. So much for the interesting oh. lecture. Do uh, you have any comments or questions you oh. want to discuss or something? Something that you have I should yeah. mention that these things yeah, are extremely mysterious. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> we, have, we have no idea what they are, how they form. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, um, it is a very mysterious structure. And, um, but I must say, I'm sure there are lots more of them. Did they manage to take some other samples from this area? We, we dredged here. Oh, yeah. there. And, ah. and here. Ah, okay. Well, the shadow reaction is where it's up about there. Um, and we've been back and dredged some more, and we've only ever found one fragment this big of impact crater. Mm. So. Um, but, but, but you didn't find any similar impact craters on land? No. No. I, I looked around, I found a lake that I think might be another one, oh. but it's in sand. And yeah. trying to find an impact, you know, there's nothing there, unfortunately. Um, so, yes, impact craters, sometimes you get several of them because the object is broken up uh, before it enters the atmosphere. So it would be reasonable. Uh, oh. And there are, there are some other mysterious structures around here that we don't know what they are. Exactly. That was my second question. Did they mark the rest of the area around no. this no. region? No. That would be interesting. It, it would be very interesting. Yeah, if, if they found similar yeah. structure on the seafloor, yeah. especially on the shallow water, yeah. and now that we have AUV, so you, you can go there and map the region with the AUV, so AUV will give you the bathymetry in centimeters. So you can see the whole structure of the seafloor morphology. Yes. So no, I, th I think it has tremendous possibilities. But so yeah. one thing of interest to me was the whole social aspect, the yeah. fact that we had a hydrographic surface which wouldn't release the map. Yeah. Um, and, and these, when we think of scientific process and progress, and we and we we often think of the ideal way that it, that it advances. Yeah. And when you actually do research, you realise all the uh, the problems that you have, um, and uh, and, it, and it's perfectly natural that these things happen. But you think, oh, it's, it's just happening to me, but no, it happens to everybody. <laughs> no, uh, no problems, uh, uh, yes, these kind of problems uh, always exist. But say, uh, I've got, I know a lot of people who are doing the mapping in Hudson's Bay, oh, okay. and they haven't found yes, anything yes. in Hudson's Bay yet. At the southern part of Spain, I think so. There is. They map an area, the southern part of Spain, and they have similar uh, concave circulars. Oh, really? and, um, yes, I think. I, I think so. I mean, there, if you have a lot of sediments, you can get gas escape structures, yeah, yeah, yeah. which can look a little similar. But once you have a central uplift like that, then it, it's very difficult to think of anything other than no, They are not both marks, I think. Sure. The, yeah, there. So, um, so anyway, we'd love to know how, how old this thing is. Um, uh, because I, I'm convinced that it actually postdates the last interglacial. So this was, I think, an impact on ice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was two or three kilometers of ice here. So the impact was on the ice sheet, and it penetrated, excavated right through the ice sheet into the bedrock. Mm -hmm. In which case, it's the only uh, ice impact yeah. uh, known on Earth. <laughs> so, um, Maybe you should suggest that it's a salt dome, so that petroleum geologists... <laughs> <laughs> well, we, 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 can't, we can't get any... We have old seismics for the region, but there yeah. are no new seismics because there are other whales here. And so... Uh, ah, and so they're yeah. forbidden to do Yeah, yeah exactly. There's, there's, uh, there's minky whales, yeah. blue whales. And, uh, yeah. It's um, a protected area. Yes, it's a protected area. Yeah. So yeah, so we can't. But you know, we could do we could do shallow seismics without any problems. Yeah. Yeah. But not deep seismics. No. Oh, you can use ARV. You can use ARV, and you you can collect samples in specific place. Oh, yes. the, oh, yeah. You cannot use only dreads, but you yes. can use ARV, yes. so you can see what kind of samples you want to collect. Oh, it would be lovely to go back there. Okay. Um, 
but I, ha I have to get more money. <laughs> That's a big problem. I was saying that no, boats are very expensive. Yeah, I know. I know. That, I know. that little boat was twenty thousand dollars a day, oh. uh, and so um, we then had to pay for the equipment as well. Yeah. that was just the boat. Yeah, yeah. I thought that the oceanography is a very luxurious sport. It is a luxurious sport, yes. yes. You need somebody who has lots and lots of money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you have some other questions? Uh, yeah. Okay. Just I wanted to ask uh, for the role of quartz that you found this grey. Where does it come from? It's, um, that's a little bit of it. The, the limestone there, uh, the very base of the limestone is very impure and has a certain amount of quartz grains on it. Because mm -hmm. we have one outcrop of limestone on, directly deposited on the Gabbro. And there is quartz, because remember the Canadian Shield is only um, a few kilometers away to the north. It's 20 kilometers away to the north. And so you've got 2,000 kilometers of glaciated rock to contribute the quartz. Mm -hmm. There are other quartz grains there, but none of them have this structure. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's unusual. I mean, to say the evidence we have is the shape, but it's not strong evidence. And did you do any geochemistry? Not on the sediments, no. Um, most, sediment, most impact structures, um, the impactor does not leave any significant chemical trace. Uh, there are a very small number of, of impactors where the actual meteorite deposited material which you can still analyze. But they're probably one tenth of a percent or one percent perhaps. Uh, they're very, very unusual. Uh, so yes, the actual fragments of the impactor we would we would be unlikely to see. I mean for the Chishalub event, you know, the end, end, uh, end Cretaceous event, there are two or three grains, two millimeters across, which are thought to represent the impact. And that was a huge impact. Yeah. Um, so um, usually you only see the impact if it's an iron meteorite. And then and then, then you will see fragments of it. But otherwise, and most meteorites obviously are not iron meteorites, they're silicon meteorites. So, um, so yeah, we, we, were really, we were not even really particularly looking fragments of the meteorite because it's so unusual uh, to see it. And the point with the diamonds, uh, was it from the same sampling area? Uh, the, the diamonds, the micro diamonds are from a number of different areas, from Europe, uh, from uh, North America, uh, because the Younger Dryas impact event is usually thought to be uh, in North America. Uh, nothing here. Mm. Not here, no, we have no micro diamonds from here. But we don't see the, uh, the layer, we don't see the younger dryas layer. Mm. We could do, I mean, we could, we've never caught down, well, we have caught down, to, no, we didn't caught down to it. We caught down very close to it, but we never got to, to it itself. Something very important, but I think I didn't understand very well. According to your opinion, this impact crater is connected to the cooling of the younger Dryas period or no? No, no, I don't think it is. Um, I think it's an older event, uh, but not much older. I think it's somewhere between 140,000 and 13,000, which, which was when was the glacial period. So I think it was an impact on ice. Uh, we have tried to date it with um, um, looking at uranium helium in glass, but the, the, for various reasons the mass spectrometer never worked properly for it. And uh, dating glasses, helium has, it's a, you know, has a, uh, a very high diffusion rate, especially in glass, so we weren't expecting much success. Anybody who's ever bought a party balloon knows that helium diffuses very fast. <laughs> so, um, um, so no, I, the problem we have was that we said that is the minimum age because it's the deglaciation age. And the supporters of the Younger Dryas impact event said that is the age. Yeah. Whereas we didn't ever say that, we said that's the limit of the age. <laughs> 
So, yes, uh, but you know, people often pick what they want. Of course, your papers. And you do have the problem is that you know you, you release your research, but you don't control what anybody does with it. <laughs> I have a lot of problems. Yes, yes. yes. So. Okay, any other question? Okay, so thank you so, so much. Yeah, <laughs> okay. 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 Okay.